Welcome back. Let's continue the conversation with Professor Kuleka Mlisana, co-chairperson of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, and Professor Rudo Matiba, head of intensive care medicine at the Chris Hani Baraguana Academic Hospital. Uh, Prof. Matiba, I'll start with you this time because, uh, you know, it's very important to get a sense of the realities in hospitals, right? And you spoke about how the SANDF deployment was a joke. I'm done complaining about what wasn't done properly. Let's talk about solutions. What needs to happen for your hospital and any other hospital to manage the amount of numbers in terms of the patients needing to be admitted? Okay, I, I suggested at a meeting this morning that we need to get our priorities right, that we need to go through the patients that we are carrying discharge the patients that are there for elective procedures. Elective procedures are those procedures that can wait, even if it's for the next three to four weeks, and give that patient an appointment to come back. This is to free up space. You might be waiting for a CT scan or to have bloods, you know, blood tests done. We give you an appointment to come back for those things to be done. We free up space to accommodate the acutely ill COVID patients. That way we can repurpose beds that are already staffed so we can use those beds immediately. And we, we, that way we strengthen the already functioning facilities. We're not talking about theoretical beds that we're still going to find staff for. These are beds that are existing, we're repurposing them. So we can do that quickly but that needs decisive leadership from the top. And that may actually need tighter restrictions that will obviously lock out people from coming to the hospital, but it will also need explanation to the communities that during this time, we won't be supplying the following services for a fixed period of time. And we get our, our, our house in order we service the COVID patients, but at the same time, the communities then do their part and try and mitigate against further spread of the virus. And maybe that way we cut down on the number of infections and we see less severe, severely ill patients. Mm. Perhaps that might help. And we free up space, we get more COVID patients in, we treat them the best way we know how, and we get those better and we can discharge them. At the same time, we use this empty shells to quarantine patients that cannot quarantine themselves at home. Those facilities can actually serve people that are able to, to, to move around and kind of do things for themselves, and they don't need high-intensity nursing or looking after so you don't actually have to go looking for HR and doctors and nurses, but those people just need maybe food and a bed to sleep in. You quarantine them because now you've gone and done close the Nasrek quarantine facility for no good reason. Yeah. We told you not to close it, but you closed it. So this is what we can do. We, we strengthen the functioning facilities. At the same time, we look at the Charlotte Matrike Hospital and see which sections we can quickly reopen. We need that hospital back online, ASAP. We cannot afford to be one academic hospital down. It's not as though we have always been compliant with our buildings of hospitals. Why now are we so hard-assed about being compliant with this building? I don't understand the reasoning when lives are at stake. Now we suddenly can get into that building. We know which part is damaged. We can avoid that part and get engineers to work on that. The part that is not damaged can be utilized. We've got ICUs in that hospital that can be utilized. We are also damaging the training programs of future healthcare workers, medical doctors that is on hold right now. It's next to a medical school. Yeah. We're not training medical students. So we, we need to take those things into account. So it's, it's a multifactorial approach that we need to take. I really hope that, you know, government is listening to you because it seems like they haven't been. 
And I'll tell you why I'm saying this, because uh, Prof Mlisana, I spoke to you about those field care facilities that were set up and then dismantled. And you said that shouldn't have happened, that they should have been uh, kept there open in preparation for the third and fourth wave possibly, especially with our vaccination rollout being a sham. It's pathetic to say the least, right? So why then has none of this happened? Why has your advice not been taken to the president? Which is why I asked you, what's your advice to the president? Because it doesn't seem like you've been listened to. Well, at the end of the day, Shahan, I mean, the truth of the matter is that our mandate is to actually provide advice to the minister. And that's where it ends. And so when we provide the advice, we leave it to the minister. And we know now that the minister has got to take it through various you know, bodies. And so it becomes difficult to answer the question that you're asking me, because, I mean, as you are aware that, I mean, we have been talking about the concerns about Charlotte McClake, about the fact that this, there's got to be a plan on how to increase the, bed, uh, the, the number of beds in Gauteng. But, you know, here we are today and we're still talking about the same thing. But at the same time, what I always say is, this should have been done two weeks ago or even earlier, but it has not happened. So I really appreciate some of the proposals that are very clear that uh, Professor Matiba is, is bringing across. And I'm hoping, we really as MEC are hoping that these proposals can really be taken seriously and be actioned as soon yeah. as you know, as possible. Why, why must you be hopeful, though? You are a team of experts who were set up to advise the health minister, and the health minister is supposed to take that information to the necessary people and make sure that it is looked at properly and, of course, considered. Ultimately, the president has the final say. So going forward, I mean, I, I'm running out of time. Going forward, in terms of restrictions, do you recommend that there should be travel restrictions, in particular from Gauteng to other provinces? And do you recommend that there's a ban on alcohol sales? We are actually looking at that and we're seriously considering those, uh, uh, those options. The issue with uh, travel you know, restrictions is as long as we're going to make sure that there's close monitoring of that. Because otherwise then it, it becomes pointless when we say we are increasing the levels of restrictions in the Khauten province and then everybody moves you know, across to the other provinces. And it, so really when, we, when we're crafting that advisory, we're going to be looking at all of that and that is going to be coming through to the minister as soon as possible. In fact, we're hoping to meet the acting minister of health within a day or two. And very quickly, uh, would you consider a level four or level five? lockdown? We would need to consider, remember, you know, there's always this balance against lives and livelihoods. So we would need to look at what actually are the implications of whatever level that we're deciding upon. And once we've got all the data, then we're able to make, you know, a, a decision where we know that we've looked at all avenues. But I mean, that's some, and remember, we actually discussed as a committee. And so everybody will put in, you know, their, 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 their thoughts and then we will craft an advisory and it will be very clear. But we just need to make sure that we collect yeah. all the data necessary. Well, that it is scientifically based. I'm sorry, I have to leave it right there. I wish you could both come back on tomorrow night at 9 o'clock to speak to me. I'm going to try to get my team to reach out so we can continue the conversation. I appreciate your time and your insight. Professor Kulek